Should he assume the presidency, Joe Biden's choice for health and human services could have serious implications on your religious freedom. Attorney Harmeet Dillon is here with analysis. And later, she's the former host of NBC's Today Show, and before that, she became a TV legend alongside the late Regis Philbin. Kathy Lee Gifford is here to talk about what really matters in life and her inspiring new memoir, It's Never Too Late. Finally, the jailing of a prominent Catholic Chinese dissident in Hong Kong is being condemned by leaders all over the world. But why the silence from the Vatican? The Wall Street Journal's Bill McGurn will weigh in. The world over begins right now. Now, Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over a very important show. Kathy Lee Gifford, Harmeet Dillon, and Bill McGurn are all straight ahead. If you'd like to comment on the show tonight, send me a tweet, nice ones, at Raymond Arroyo. Lots to cover. Let's get started. President-elect Joe Biden formally announced his health care team this week, naming California Attorney General Javier Becerra as his choice for Health and Human Services Secretary. But what does Basera's appointment mean for health care and the legal issues surrounding religious liberty? Joining us to discuss this and more is attorney at the Center for American Liberty and the Dillon Law Group, Harmeet Dillon. Harmeet, I want to begin with Javier Basera as Health and Human Services Secretary. He has a legal background, but zero frontline health care experience. What does this appointment tell you about the Biden administration's priorities when it comes to health care policy and perhaps more importantly, the freedom of conscience and religious liberty? Well, I think it's an odd choice, and I think even people on the left think so. Uh, the uh, attorney general of California is a former congressman. That's what he's done for most of his career. He was briefly a prosecutor before that, and his claim to fame mm -hmm. has been suing President Trump uh, over 100 times in California. So he would have been a natural fit for a Biden administration as attorney general. He has zero health care yeah. experience other than suing people who are critical of Planned Parenthood. And he has policy chops only in the sense that every other Democrat has policy chops regarding uh, the Affordable Care Act. So I think what this mm -hmm. tells you, number one, is that he that Biden probably wants to appoint a woman for attorney general for virtue signaling purposes, and that's why they fit uh, Becerra somewhere else. But Becerra has shown a rabid commitment to persecuting anybody who criticizes Planned Parenthood. And that, I suspect, is a top policy priority for the Biden administration. And so that gives comfort to all of the um, abortion warriors out there that HHS is going to impose a very radical, um, radical agenda on people who protest that. Yeah. Uh, following the Supreme Court decision in favor of the Little Sisters of the Poor this past July, Harmeet, which upheld the exemption for the sisters from that contraceptive mandate, uh, Joe Biden had this to say in a statement. He said, if I am elected, I will restore the Obama-Biden policy that existed before the Hobby Lobby ruling, providing an exemption for houses of worship and an accommodation for nonprofit organizations with religious missions. Now, as California Attorney General since 2017, Becerra has filed, as you mentioned, 107 lawsuits to overturn various Trump actions designed to expand religious or moral exemptions in these, for these health care requirements. Um, your thoughts on what this will mean uh, to that particular policy? Uh, I imagine they're going to try to deprive everybody. If you read between the lines of what Biden said, any religious organization will be deprived of their exemptions. That's what they really mean there. Right. Well, the way that these folks get around the obvious First Amendment issue of compelling uh, the provision of these types of abortifacients by a religious organization is to say, well, if they're providing services in the marketplace, like as a hospital or as a hospice or, you know, daycare facility, they're really, you know, they're not really operating as a religious entity like a church, and so they should be subject to all of the same rules. That's the tack that they're going to take. And of course, as you know, in, 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 uh, in many organizations and many faiths, 
the provision of such services to the public, to the poor, is 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 part of the faith. It's part of my faith as a Sikh, and so yeah. I, it's it's kind of an exception that swallows the rule, if you will. So I would expect mm. Javier Becerra to be very much a culture warrior. I mean, the fact that even over the objections of many liberal uh, lawyers and commentators, he has persecuted our client uh, David Delayden, the founder of the Center oh, yeah. for American Liberty, who exposed fetal part trafficking. I'm engaged in half a dozen lawsuits right now around the country over that. But he's the one who was the attorney general who has continued the first prosecution ever of a journalist in California under the wiretapping statute here. And this is a California where you can steal stuff, you can, you know, stab people, whatever, and get away with it. But how dare you expose Planned Parenthood's butchery to the public? Hmm. No, it's, it's outrageous. And, you know, uh, we knew where Javier Vacero was. I mean, everybody knew as a, when he was a congressman, later as attorney general of California. But for Joe Biden to anoint this individual after saying he wants to heal, he wants to be the unifier, he's the guy we always see paddling into church every Sunday holding his rosary beads. What does that tell you about the depth of that commitment to his faith or professed faith? When you see well, I mean, I think like this. absolutely. I, I think he's a fake Catholic. Of course, I'm not a Catholic, but it just seems to me that basic principles of that faith uh, are are abrogated on a daily basis by the policies that this man is pushing, that the Democratic Party is pushing. And now with this appointment, one can confirm that. I mean, what it also shows mm -hmm. us is that he's not serious about health. Like, I would think even for, you know, a Democrat, if you, there are tons of doctors out there who, who have yeah. knowledge of public health, why don't you appoint one of them to the situation um, in, in this position? It, so it really, mm -hmm. it, it only checks a political box. What I'm seeing here is a Kamala Harris influence on a lot of things happening because because uh -huh. jobs are being found for top California leaders, creating more opportunities for others. That's what's happening here, in my opinion. Otherwise, why would you go out of your way to pick this guy? Um, you know, other than his hatred of uh, people who criticize Planned Parenthood, he doesn't really add anything to the mix from a healthcare perspective. Hmm. What can we expect from Becerra's head of HHS when it comes to this contraceptive mandate, particularly for these groups, uh, groups that you've defended, as well as the Little Sisters of the Poor and others? Uh, I think you can expect him to attempt to go out of his way to persecute them. That is what he has shown. Mm. He has shown zero respect for faith, zero respect for right and wrong, zero consideration that maybe there are shades of gray in the position that the left is taking. He, he will not... He, he has future and political ambitions beyond that job, I can tell you. So he will not be satisfied with simply, um, you know, sort of finding some middle ground, which is what Joe Biden has previously suggested that he would mm -hmm. do. And so I think you're going to see some major policy changes. Of course, the Affordable Care Act, as they call it, the Unaffordable Care Act, as I call it as an employer, mm -hmm. uh, will be front and center, providing more expansive health care for illegal aliens, for yeah, and everybody who provides services and gets services is going to have to subscribe to a particular political agenda. And that is really dangerous and unfortunate for the millions, hundreds of millions of Americans of faith who don't agree mm -hmm. that our health care should be conditioned on such a radical agenda. Uh, Harmeet, this past November, the Supreme Court heard arguments in a case, uh, California versus Texas, challenging the constitutionality of the, the Affordable Care Act's individual mandate and asking the court to decide whether the entire law can remain in, in play. What do you expect to see when the court rules on this? And what do you think this administration, who have made it very clear that they will fight for the ACA, plan to do in reaction? Well, based on my tea leaf reading of the argument, mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't expect to see the Affordable Care Act to be struck down completely. Um, that is just not within the uh, tenor of the types of rulings that our Chief Justice is, is willing to willing to do. And I think it would be it would be a big lift for the other five so-called conservative mm -hmm. wing of the court to. Uh, you know, go against his leadership on this. Uh, his his uh, earlier ruling on the Affordable Care Act, of course, was quite shocking and I think illegitimate uh, intellectually. And so, you know, he has left us with this um, bizarre uh, half breed of a statute at this point. So, yes, I think what we're going to see from a Biden administration, especially if, uh, you know, depending on how many uh, members of Congress and, and members of the Senate shake out, they're going to be pushing very hard for this so-called universal health care and the expansion of it to 
tens of millions, ten, ten, uh, over 10 million uh, illegal aliens in this country is further going to complicate access to health care for all Americans. So it's uh, wow. it's 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 going to be very, particularly states like California here. Um, you know, of course, yeah. you know we have we have a way for them to get health care, emergency rooms, and so forth. But really, we are not solving the problem of people living in the shadows here, and it's not being solved by giving them health care. That is going to, in fact, increase the number of people who come here and and live in this uh, twilight world of mm -hmm. uh, illegal yeah. status. So. Uh, lastly, Harmeet, uh, I want to move to another aspect of religious liberty. Uh, last week, the Supreme Court vacated a lower court order that rejected emergency petitions filed by churches who were seeking to have indoor services. This after Governor Gavin Newsom banned indoor services in most of the state. Now, the Supreme Court instructed the California courts to reconsider in light of their New York ruling. Your thoughts on what will happen? I know you defended a number of churches uh, that were fighting for the right to have their services. Yes, unfortunately, just weeks before this ruling, I think two or three weeks, uh, our first religion case here in California was actually dismissed. Uh, but we are on the mm. briefs in the South Bay case, which is the case that went up to the United States Supreme Court first. And Justice Roberts, again, uh, gave uh, a, I think, very poorly thought out um, quashing of our position. But the court with Justice Barrett has flipped on that issue. And so the if our same cases had come up to the Supreme Court with Justice Barrett, the opposite result would have occurred, and there'd be a lot more religious liberty in California this year. But we expect what's going to happen is that the Ninth Circuit um, has, in fact, I believe, just in the last day or so, vacated its uh, prior ruling and sent the case back down mm. to the district court. So the district court will now uh, make a further determination based on the guidance given by uh, the United States Supreme Court in the um, in the the Catholic diocese case. Mm -hmm. well, uh, we'll keep monitoring that. And Harmeet, thank you for the update and for staying on these cases. We'll check in with you soon. Thanks again. Thank you, Raymond. She's the four-time Emmy-winning former host of NBC's Today Show. She had an 11-year run there, but she's perhaps best known for the 15 years she spent as co-host of Live with Regis and Kathy Lee. In addition to being a TV legend, she's a playwright, producer, singer, songwriter, and actress. She's also had her share of personal lows, but her faith in God and her seemingly boundless energy have kept her always moving forward. She's now the author of a new memoir, It's Never Too Late, Make the Next Act of Your Life the Best Act of Your Life. She joined me earlier this week from her home in Nashville. Here's my exclusive interview with Kathy Lee Gifford. <laughs> Kathy Lee, welcome to the show. I loved your new book, It's Never Too Late, the faith and tenacity of the book. And I think the message for people entering a new chapter of their lives, it's so important. Now, you've done some incredible things since you became a widow in 2015. I guess retirement's out of the question, Kathy? Well, I read the Bible every day in its original source, you know, the Greek and the Hebrew. And what I've noticed, uh -huh. Raymond, is that nobody, nobody retired in the Bible. They just died, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to die well, doing what God to do that day. And that's fine with me. Well, I love how you followed your inspirations, particularly the things that were not yet done, that you're finding time now to do. And, uh, I mean, you've had a very busy year. Your movie, Then Came You, which is a romantic comedy you wrote, you produced, you starred in. That premiered this year. What was the impetus for that? What was the inspiration? I know Craig Ferguson is connected here. Yes. Uh, yes. And Craig is an old friend of mine, and uh, I just adore him. He hosted the Today Show with me one week, and it was insanity, and I was so happy. It was just like crazy television, exciting and pre unpredictable and hysterically funny and sexy and all those good things and, and mm -hmm. real. And we've always been, we've always loved each other's work. And we said, one of these days, well, so that when we left after that week, he says, let's have, let's have lunch and we're talking about, you know, so he sits there with me and he uses much more colorful language, but he goes, you know, Kathy, if we wait for our mm, agents to get us a job on television, we're going to die wait. Why don't we just write a movie together? So he went home to California. I went to bed that night in Greenwich, uh, uh, where I live. I woke up at two o'clock in the morning, like that dog in Up, the movie. Squirrel, I knew what the movie should be. So I got downstairs, got the coffee two o'clock in the morning and wrote six scenes, 
called him the next day and I said, you know that movie that we were going to write? He goes, yeah, like we talked yesterday. And I said, yeah, I think <laughs> I've written it. And he goes, what? <laughs> I said, send it to me. So I sent him what I had. It was actually all six scenes are in the movie. And um, and he called me back and he goes, Kenny, you know what? I, I stand, this is your baby. I stand ready to serve. And so wow. I raised the money. I was coming down to Nashville for a solid year, um, working on all the music uh, with a brilliant writer named Brett James. And, mm -hmm. um, and so I was co-writing all of that with him. And so I had to be here. I got to know that I've always worked in Nashville. I've recorded three albums here during the, I've done a mm -hmm. situation comedy, He All Honey's back in 1978. Mm -hmm. I, I, yeah. I love Nashville and I love the people, but I had never considered living here. And every time I got a on a plane, actually, Raymond, to go home on Sunday nights, I'd go, why do I not want to go home? What mm. is it about this place that makes me so happy? And I realized there's just a culture of kindness here. And I was going back to what I'd been living in for almost 40 years of people yelling at you, people screaming, nobody giving each other the common decency to finish a sentence before you try to rip them off and cancel them. And I said, I can't do this anymore. This, I, my soul is rotting. I am not doing the work God has called me to do since I was a child. I'm going to get back to it. I adore Hoda. I adored our staff over there at the Today Show, our crew, top notch. I still talk to them all the time. And I go on the Today Show as if I'm still there. Everything yeah, I do, I'm practically a co-host. But I don't have to get up anymore and um, in the morning and, and, and travel fight the same, you know, potholes I've been going over for 40 years and, and go to that, into that mm -hmm. culture. And, and, and I just said, I, I, I want, I want the quality of life in my life back. My husband was gone. Mm -hmm. My children had moved to California to pursue their dreams. And I was dying of loneliness. And I said, I'm going to make, uh, and I'm, Brett and I wrote a song called New Everything. So it goes, how right. do I begin to begin again? Breathe deep and let all the Oh, cold, fresh air in or something like, how do I have to find the courage to say, I'm going to start a brand new life today? Because only you can, you know? I, I see people, somebody asked, what's the difference between wishing something and dreaming? And I said, well, wishing you just sit there. Dreams, you open the door and go out. You know, wishing right. if you, that somebody show up at your door and, and, you know, save you from everything and, or be ch Prince Charming. And, and, and I, you know, I just thought, I don't believe that. I believe God gave us everything we need to co-create with him in this life. And I want to co-create and I want to cooperate with him in it. So, you know, he can open the door, but I got to go through it and I got to trust. And I'm here two years and I love it. When I read the book, that spirit, that availability to what God is calling you to in this moment was mm -hmm. everywhere throughout this work. And it's in your life. Um, I mean, and I've, I've been amazed at how you were able to leave these shows that you were an integral part of, I mean, live with, with Regis and Kathy Lee, was for 15 years, must-see viewing every day. You and Hoda, of course, for 11 years. But how do you leave things like that at their zenith? What You told us why you left the, the Today Show. Why did you leave Regis and Kathy Lee live when you did? Same reason. I've been listening to the voice of God, Raymond, and I hear him. People think you're crazy. Okay. It's worked out well. I'm, I'm certainly, I'm going to hang up on some other people maybe, but not, not hang it up on Jesus. <laughs> he spoke to me as a child, a little 12-year-old girl sitting in a darkened movie theater in Annapolis, Maryland. And I was at the cusp of, of womanhood. And he said to me, Kathy, I love you. And I want to make something beautiful out of your life. And if you trust me, I will. I walked down the aisle, asked Jesus into my heart, and never looked back. And uh, hmm. so I still know that voice when I hear it, and he speaks to me every day, every day. Mm. And it, it's not audible sometimes, it'll be, it'll be in a person sitting on the side of the street that, that I just, I walk past and then the Lord says, no, Kathy, go talk to them. Yep. Give them what they need, go yeah. find, to ask, you know, I, he just, I hear it. I write in the book about hearing the voice of the Lord at, at the Today Show, say, go downstairs and say hello to Howard Stern, who had had a 30 year vendetta against me. And I said, okay, Lord, I just listen. Because, you know, otherwise the voices in this world drown out the voice of God. 
You know, it's loud and noisy and obnoxious and rude out there. But in the stillness of my heart, I hear God speak to me as if I was still that, that innocent little 12 year old girl sitting in that movie theater. He still wants to make something beautiful out of my life. And he still wants me to tell people that God loves them. That's the message of this. It's, it's through my own stories and through my own experiences. But, but the story is the same. You know what? You can't tell God how and when. But if you do the right thing, you pray for people you care about, you share God's love with them, you leave judgment unto him, unto God. Nobody has a right to judge anybody. None of us are better than anybody else. God doesn't love me any more than he loves anybody else. The difference is I know that God loves me. And so I want to love him back. The best way I can love God back is by loving people. And uh, yeah. leaving all and the judgment up to, to him. him. And listening and to him, which you do. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and you see it. And it's not always easy. I mean, you give up a lot to, to make these turns and to take these chances to do what he's calling you to in that moment. Um, I, I, musicals. I mean, I saw your musical. I know it ran for a couple of weeks, but I thought it was really good. Um, uh, you did you. some off-Broadway work. You, you, I mean, you've recorded in Nashville. You, you've done films in Israel. Um, and in recent days, it seems your pace is increasing. I need to spend a moment on Regis. The two of you taught all of us in broadcasting so much. I ran into Reed one day uh, at Fox and I told him what an inspiration he was to me and I'll say the same thing to yeah. you. What was the source of that magic with him? You know, I, I was going through a divorce when I moved to New York. It's the only reason I accepted the job at Good Morning America. I said, all right, I'm gonna do a year. It's good for me to get away. It's been a very, very tough time, very uh, painful uh, period in my life. It'll be good. Mm -hmm. I was offered this, this new, role at Good Morning America. And I thought, mm. I get there and, and well, you know, I wasn't really happy there because back then it was very teleprompter and I'm not a journalist right. so I didn't pretend to be one, but I just felt like it was the right place for me at the time. Never dreaming I'd end up meeting, you know, the love of my life there. Uh, a few years later when I stayed a few more, I stayed ultimately because one morning I watched Regis on the local show in New York. I had already watched him on the local show in Los Angeles for years. He was Mr. Right. He was Mr. Now he's becoming Mr. New York. And I, and I thought to myself, I love that guy. Every time I turn on the television, he's doing something stupid, but it's funny. Mm -hmm. He's doing something yeah. outrageous, which came to be outrageous. And he is <laughs> as smart as the whip and the best storyteller I've ever, ever seen. And I just thought, I want to be with him. This is what I need to be doing with my life. I need to be hanging out with somebody that has the exact same sense of humor and is the same background mm -hmm. in entertainment. He and I were entertainers, not journalists. And we could talk right. to a rock. And so um, <laughs> I called my agent and they were about ready to give me the number one role at that. That's what they were grooming me for at Good Morning America. And I said, right. I don't want it. I said, but you're gonna be, I said, I don't want it. I wanna be happy. My joy is mm. non-negotiable. I don't wanna read a teleprompter for a living. It's not me. Mm. I, wanna, I wanna do crack balls with rim shots and make people laugh. I want to sit on people's laps and rub their bald heads. That's what I do. <laughs> and uh, my agent thought I was crazy. It was Barbara Walters who heard that I was thinking about going over and joining Regis at the at the at the morning show, and she 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 did this to me, like she beckoned me. Mm -hmm. And when the queen of everything in New York beckoned you, you went <laughs> over there, and she was, "What is this I hear, my dear, about you might be joining Regis?" And I said, I don't know, Barbara, everybody's telling me crazy. I, I shouldn't do it. I want to do it, but they're all saying I shouldn't do it because, you know, uh, Regis is a local show. And she looked at me as with those wise eyes of hers. And she goes, honey, Toledo is local. And she didn't say it to put down Toledo in any way. She did it to tell the truth, which is there are local markets and then there is New York. And if you and Regis harness what that energy that the two of you have, that humor, that sensibility that the world is insane. Can we be part of it? <laughs> you know? uh, uh, she said, you won't be, you won't be uh, local for long. And we weren't. I joined him in June. By September, we'd moved uh, to the number one uh, show in, in New York. And we were that for three years. And we said, you know, we did something very smart, if I do say so. Regis and I both agreed that we would never go national unless somebody agreed to just let us be our same show and just took us up on a satellite. Mm. Didn't come in suits who know better 
and tell us what we could or could not do. We knew it would be the kiss of death. We said no. We said no to, you know, until Disney came along and said, we want you just as you are. You can read the New York newspapers. We just, you, can, you can tell stories about growing up in the Bronx. Kathy, you can talk about Jesus, whatever, you know, <laughs> and whatever's working. They, and to their credit, they let us be. We weren't an instant hit. Uh, it took a year. I'm, I'm stunned they kept us on for a year, but they did. The world's changed, Raymond, I, as you know. I mean, it has. people don't be on the air long enough. And with social media, Regis and I wouldn't have lasted five minutes with social media. But we waited yeah. until somebody believed in us enough to put, to basically bet their horse on us. And, Tell um, me. and, we, did. and we changed the face of television forever, for better or for worse. We did. You know, we, we rewrote the landscape of daytime TV. And, um, and, and I, I've always just said, how do you, why do you leave at times? I always follow my gut. I have a mind uh -huh. and I have a soul and I have a body, but I also have a gut. And it mm -hmm. speaks to me. God speaks to me through that too. He says, he, he's, he tells me, I know you're, you're grateful for this, but you're in a velvet rut and I've got more to teach you. And now in this, this time in my life, if somebody would have told me that I would have, um, on the same year that my both of my children get married, I have the number one movie in the country. It's a little movie I wrote for, you know, th then came you, which is now worldwide. Right. And then you're going to do three more oratorios with the, with the Nashville Symphony Orchestra. And oh, also, you're going to have two, two big books. Uh, and, and I said, right. this year, and th this year, I've had the most outrageously busy, exciting, thrilling year of my life. And that's yeah. only God. Only God can do that in the middle of a pandemic. You bet. You know? You bet. Before I leave Regis, because I, I, there's a lot I need to cover with you, tell the story about earlier this year, if you can believe it, January of 2020, when Regis presented you with an award in L.A. Was that the last time you all were together? I saw him in January, as you just said. It's something the the, the, the uh, movie guide award. Mm -hmm. He was giving me an award. I didn't want to go. And then they said, well, Regis is going to give it to you. I said, again, squirrel. And I said, I'll be there. I go, and uh -huh. he didn't show up for the long time. He was supposed to be there for hours before, and then he wasn't. I went, mm -hmm. oh, Lord, bless him. Because I knew he was mm -hmm. fading. You know, he was 88 mm -hmm. then and was sharp as a tack for so many years, at the top of his game mm -hmm. for so many years. But we always got together. We, were, we worked together for 15 years. We were, then we were friends for 20 after that, exactly 20 mm -hmm. years. So 35 years of friendship. And so I was afraid uh, that he might be struggling and he wasn't reading prompter the way he once did. I mean, nobody could do what Regis used to do. Mm -hmm. And I was concerned about him. So I was just, Lord, please help him get here safe. Lord, and then I see him coming. Okay, thank you, Lord. Thank you. Lord, help him to help him to get up the steps. No, 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 reach to And I'm, I'm just going, you know, when you love somebody, you know? Yeah. And I just go through all of it with Frank and my mother. And you know, you do. So, so he gets his, he gets to the podium and starts reading the teleprompter and he's doing great. And then all of a sudden he's not doing great. He's struggling. And I'm going, oh, oh Lord. Please. And so then he says, and so let's bring her up right now to get that visionary award. Here she is. Kathy Lee Griffin. Oh. And the audience Yikes. catches its breath. Like, <laughs> and I'm going, mm. thank you, Lord. That's gold. And I stand up in the audience and I go, it's Gifford. <laughs> Regis looks at me and he goes, it is? <laughs> <laughs> this this is what you all did forever. And it was like vintage, classic Kathy Lee and Regis shtick. People thought mm -hmm. we planned it. No, it was oh, just I us. So I hadn't seen him until July last summer. And um, and I went to my home in Connecticut where they still had a home. They just sold it, but they were getting ready to move out of it. And I called them up and I said, can you guys come for lunch? I miss you. We had legendary lunches at my house there mm -hmm. and for years. I'd lived in that house for 27 years and they'd been there every year, of it, you know. Mm -hmm. And so um, they came and I watched them get out of the car and, uh, and walk towards the house. And I went, oh, Lord. This is going to be the last time I see him, isn't it? And I knew. Mm. So we had a wonderful lunch. We laughed our butts off. And he, he told <laughs> me, that Joy told me later, 
uh, that uh, he, when he found out that morning, he said, we're going to go see Kath today, right? And she goes, yes, honey, we're going to go to lunch with her at her house. I don't like my hair, Joey. You got to fix my hair. I, I, I got to wash mm. it and dry it. Blow dry it for me. I got to look good for Kath. Oh, so she said she did. And then the I said, oh, it said, reach. She's still have the world's greatest head of hair. And we laughed our butts off. And then when he died two weeks later, I called her, of course, and went straight to her house to see her and the girls. And uh, and she said, Kathy, I just want you to know that that was the last time I heard Regis laugh. That mm. you know, was when you when we were all together that day. And I just mm. thought that was so sweet of the Lord to give me that memory. You know, yeah. I just, he was ready to go, just like Frank was. They get tired. And when Regis couldn't be Regis anymore, he was sad yeah. that he couldn't. He had to wear a mask so people didn't know who it was. He used to come to anything, anything we did for right. him, through all the, <laughs> and he'd go, Regis is here. We could be at Carnegie <laughs> Hall. Regis is here. Any restaurant, he'd come to my house and say, Regis is here. I said, I know, shut up and sit down. You know? <laughs> but um, he, he was a character. He couldn't yeah. be Regis anymore. It broke his heart. Well, COVID is like killing great people. In more ways than just a virus, you know? I agree. It's killing their I agree. Killing their imagination. It's killing their hope and their and their purpose. It's just it yeah. breaks my heart. It, it, we've got to put this, this this world back to back to work and and, and deal with this and stop living in fear. You know, God yeah. has not given the us isolation fear is fear. terrible. And we're losing a generation of kids who are in school. And 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 I, I just hate the politics of it. We can take care of yep. one another. We know how to do that. We're America, you know. Yep, I agree. I agree. And we shouldn't. We can't live in fear. Now, Kathy Lee, in the book, you get into some very personal things you've never discussed before, including your first marriage with Paul Johnson. Why did you feel it was important to share this now? And details of your marriage with Frank Gifford and the, the difficulties of infidelity and overcoming that. Why get into all of that now? Because it helps people. It's the only reason to do it. Otherwise, it's just mm -hmm. page in history. Uh, people look at my life or yours or Laura's or you know, any successful person, and they think it's been easy. They think you haven't, you know, it was all handed to you. And I write very honestly about living in a sexless, uh, loveless marriage for six years and sleeping in the guest room and the, and the devastation of that. And so people are going to mm. look at me and go, what? I thought she was married to Frank Gifford. Yeah, I know yeah. he cheated on her once, but that was a great marriage. Yes, it was. But I, but, mm. but it, you know what it does? It humanizes me to people. And then yeah. maybe they're, they, they can see what I went through that ended up making me who I became. Everything that happens to you makes you who you become. And if, if they can see, wow, God used that hard, really bleak, pathetic time in her life, he can maybe, some good can come out of mine. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I talk about a lot of triumphs in my life too, stuff I never dreamed could happen to me. Yes. But you've got to for that. You've got to balance that with the crap that you went through. Mm -hmm. The crap, the real hard stuff. Because God no. is real in both of those, both of those, those experiences and those seasons in your life. God was faithful to me through all of that time. Mm. And when my husband left me, my first one, he wasn't a husband, and I still pray for him and wish him well. God bless him. Uh, if you know, if I ran into him today, I would hug him and, and 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 say, how are you? You know, I have no ill will. I've never had any ill will. I just mm -hmm. um never dreamed that I could get through such a period of my life. And when, when he left and I was in that desert time, I heard that voice of God say to me, he didn't love you, Kathy, but I do. Hmm. They need to know. You write, it, you write in the book, uh, Kathy, that, and you mentioned it a moment ago, that you lost bits of Frank long before he passed away. How difficult was that period for you? And, and how did you prepare for all the changes uh, that have, were, were thrust upon you in those days of, of, of his illness and then his, uh, his passing away? Well, you know, I had warnings with my daddy who had something called Lewy body dementia. We knew for eight years mm. he was dying. Just try to just keep loving him. Mm -hmm. The one time 
Well, I, my, my sister asked my dad, he said, Daddy, do you know what's wrong with you? He goes, yes, my brain is dying. Mm. But this was part of the, writing the book is about my mom and dad. And she says, mm -hmm. and she goes, are you okay, Daddy? He goes, yes. Just don't leave me alone. Mm. And so we never did, not for a moment. Not for and he died in his loved one's arms with my mom reciting for the umpteenth time the 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 twenty third psalm. You know, he died in peace mm. and just surrounded by love and he went straight into the arms of Jesus. My mother did mm. too. Died in her sleep wow. and just had been praising Jesus the night before. Get went went the way she wanted to. My husband, I found him on the floor. He had this look on his face. I knew he saw Jesus. Jesus took his breath away. He was in the arms of Jesus. I have peace. See, people that don't know God personally, how I wish they would and could and they can, because they would know that, that death is not something to fear. Death, actually, for a Christian, people think this is radical and strange and weird. The best day of a Christian's life, a believer in Jesus, the best day of their life is the day they go on to be with him. The best day. We would right. never want to come back once we're with him there. And um, I believe that with all my heart. I've been called worse than crazy, so call me whatever you want to call me. Mm. What, what, Kathy Lee, what do you want readers to take from this book, particularly those who feel life has passed them by? I've, I've now bought the book for a couple of people who um, they've, they've been, I think, in a holding pattern since losing right. their spouses or friends or family, and they can't get on with their lives. They feel it's all over. What do you want to say to them? It isn't. They're wrong. It's not over till God calls you home. Then it's over. Then, you, then it is mm -hmm. too late. But it's, too, it's not too late for the next world and life and adventure beyond. It's just too late to do anything about this world and this life that we are given uh, one time. I, I don't believe in reincarnation. I, other people can believe what they want. I give them, of course, that, that right. So anyway, um, yeah, I, I tell them that they, they need to, to um, co-create with God in their lives. If we're created in the image of God, and he's God creator, Jehovah Elohim, he created us to be creators with him. If you wanted to be a dancer when you were little, that, that, that was God's will for you. Maybe not to be a prima ballerina, but the dreams we have in us, when we are knit and woven in our mother's wombs, are there because God put them there. I believe that with all my heart. That's why I'm so happy now, fulfilling finally the dreams I had as a child, to be an actress and a singer and a director and a writer and, a, and, and put on shows. That's all I do now. And yep. I'm, I'm finally freed up to do it. And I, I know I've done, I'm, as Sondheim said to me, you've done the work, you've earned it. Yeah. And I think a lot of people want what other people have, but they don't want to earn it. They just want right. it, feel entitled right. to it. And I don't feel entitled to anything. I'm just mm -hmm. grateful for everything. And, uh, you know, a lot of people don't like what I do. That's their prerogative. They don't have to buy my book. They don't have to go to my Broadway show. They don't have to, they don't have to watch my movies. God bless them. And I said, you know what? Mm -hmm. If I'd listened to my critics, I would have lasted five days. I listened right. to the all of us. <laughs> They get me, they get me, and now I've outlived most of my critics. But so you know, you now go. they give you awards. Now they give you awards for just just surviving. You're still alive. <laughs> Dude, we need for that. You've outlasted <laughs> them, Kathy Lee. You've outlasted I, them, and only your fans remain. That's not a bad place to be. Uh, you no, also released a children's book, Hello Little Dreamer, in the fall. Why did you right. write this book, and why do you write for children? Well, I have children, and I, my children are, are hopefully one day going to have children. And I, I'm a songwriter. Uh, so basically, um, a little children's book, it takes me about 10 minutes to write. They are wow. as simple as sitting and breathing, because I write it as a song. Because a song is ah. half poetry. And I just write it as a song, and it just pours. I've written thousands of songs. I have no... I have my my uh, my my partner Christine uh, in my business. She, she's the only. I said, Christine, remember that song in back in you know whatever. And she goes, What's the name of it, Kathy? There's no way. I, and I try to remember. And I go, Oh yeah, it's that. But it's thousands. And I, mm. although I'm not known for writing songs, I, I didn't sit down and try to write hit songs. 
I sat down every time and tried to write a good song. I wrote 100 songs during my 11 years on, on uh, the Today Show for, for something we called um, Everyone Has a Story, because they right. do. And they'd send in their story. I'd write the lyrics. My friend David Friedman would put it to music. They'd come, sit in that iconic sofa, and we'd, the greatest performers in the world, Broadway stars, would sing their songs. And it would change their wow. life. And it just brought me such joy. <laughs> and that's why I start every chapter in, in uh, It's Never Too Late with some of the lyrics I've written through the years. Songwriting is not a new thing to me by any means. It's, mm -hmm. it's been, I've been doing it uh, for a long, long time now. And it, instead, a lot of people keep a journal. I write songs. You want to know what's going on yeah. in my life? Look at my song. So, um, and, it, and it, it gives me peace and I can co-create. I can take something that maybe was painful and find a place to put it that's healthy. It's like when I'm mm -hmm. angry, when, I, when, when Frank cheated on me, I got on my treadmill three times a day. And I would get mm -hmm. on and I'd go, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I got, I lost 20 pounds. <laughs> that was the good part. But the, <laughs> the, the, but the message of that was, no, I took my pain and put it on something that could take it. I didn't direct mm -hmm. it at my husband. I didn't direct it at God. I didn't direct it at my children. I didn't direct it at anybody but a machine that's, that's built to take it. And I think mm -hmm. that's what happens when we let the root of bitterness take over in our lives. We hurt people, start to hurt other people, and the next thing you know, you look back and there are carcasses behind you. You have done mm -hmm. such damage because you're so wounded. And then you make excuses for it. I don't want to make excuses for anything. I don't want to be sad. I don't want to be lonely. I don't want to be bitter. And I have a choice every morning when I wake up. All right, am I going to be lonely today? All right, I'm going to sit in my house and feel sorry for myself because it's a Sunday and nobody thinks about widows on Sunday. Or I can call a friend who's and say, you know what? I'm having a tough day. Can we go to lunch? Or will you, can you come by and have a glass of wine with me or sit and have a cup of coffee? Or can you just come and take a walk in the park? You know, right. we, can, we can be proactive in our own life and in our own happiness. You know, happiness comes from the root word happenstance. I love words. I just love the right. origins of it. I mean, and so I'm not always happy because happenstance means that your circumstances determine if you're happy or not. So some days I'm not happy at all. The circumstances are not good. But I can choose joy. I can, I can choose to be call a friend and get out of my own life and say, what's going on with you? And for a while, you know, just choose joy. I can go, and I, if it's raining, I can, I can go out and I love rain. So I'll just go there and start praising God for the rain. I said, Lord, you must think we need rain because you're sending it. So I thank you for it. The minute you have an attitude of gratitude, everything changes. It's mm. just simple. It's simple, well. but, we, but we like our pain. But I was hurt. Well, but they, they were mean to me. But they, yes, and you have lived with it for how many years? How's right. that, like, like Bill says, and how's that working for you? All right, not, not, not like, so well. <laughs> Kathy Lee, you are such a source of joy for so many, including me, uh, through your work, through who you are. And I just thank you for the time, for the book, and, uh, and for taking some time with us. I hope you'll come back. I'd be delighted, and you take care of yourself. And, and even though Jesus wasn't born on December 25th, he was conceived during Hanukkah, I wish you a Merry Christmas. <laughs> you too. Merry Christmas to you, Kathy Lee. I hope we see you again soon. <laughs> it's Never Too Late. Make the next act of your life the best act of your life by Kathy Lee Gifford. is available at bookstores everywhere and online. Communist China is tightening its grip on Hong Kong using the new national security law they imposed this past summer. Earlier this month, Jimmy Lai, the outspoken Catholic pro-democracy advocate and media tycoon, was charged with fraud and denied bail. He remains in prison. Bill McGurn this week in The Wall Street Journal wrote movingly about Jimmy Lai, his plight, and the silence of the church. We're joined now by Bill McGurn. Bill, thank you for being here. Um, Thanks, Frank. You don't only know Jimmy Lai, you're his godfather. And uh, this right. piece you wrote, uh, it, it asked uh, the very important question, where is the church and why is Pope Francis silent? Yeah, it's, here's the reason for the question. As you mentioned, China is tightening its grip on Hong Kong. 
And this national security law is what provoked all those protests last year. So Jimmy was arrested on these trumped up charges of fraud, business fraud. It's a contract dispute over his office building. And uh, like others, he hasn't actually been charged with a national security offense yet. But when his bail hearing came, the, uh, the government took the position that he was a national security risk. So they denied him bail on those grounds. So we still don't know what national security charges he faces. And by the way, that's not unique to him. The same day that, um, that he was arrested, three young pro-democracy champions, uh, Joshua Wong, Agnes Chow, and Ivan Lam, they, uh, they pleaded guilty some, to some charges and were sent to prison. Um, Agnes mm -hmm. is also a Catholic. Uh, as you mentioned, Jimmy is the founder of one of Hong Kong's most popular newspapers, Apple Daily. Right. Very strong, um, very pro-American, anti-communist, and right. um, and he's also he's also Hong Kong's most prominent Catholic. Wow. Have you spoken to the Lai family? Do uh, Do we know how he's doing? I think he's doing well. I I've spoken I've spoken to his wife Teresa who is just a pillar of strength. And I've mm. spoken to some people who have met him, and I would like, I, you know, I'd like to go visit him over there. I don't know if I'll get the chance. But my suspicion is that when people come in there, um, Jimmy consoles them rather than the other way around. One of his associates mm. just texted me last night saying he had just visited Jimmy, and Jimmy said, don't worry about me. In my suffering, I see the glory of God. Mm. I want to give people a sense of uh, who Jimmy is. This is a little clip of him from a, a conference he took part in earlier. Watch. You know, being a Catholic, you have the instinct to stand up what, for what is wrong. You know, because that's the way that you walk in the way of the Lord. Uh, now, in November, Bill, Pope Francis welcomed NBA players, American basketball players, to discuss their efforts to address social justice. Yet the case of Jimmy Lai and even Cardinal Joseph Zen couldn't get a meeting with the Pope to discuss this Vatican-China agreement. This agreement, by the way, has been renewed, even though China is one of the worst abusers of religious liberty. How are the long-suffering faithful in China receiving all of this, particularly in Hong Kong, Bill? They're, they're really suffering. It's very dispiriting. I, I think there's enough evidence that this deal has been a disaster. It gives the communist government in Beijing, which is hostile to all religion, um, incredible say over the selection of bishops. It has not eased up repression. Um, you know, I mean, I was taught that uh, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. And, mm -hmm. you know, the lies are saying, where is our shepherd? Where is he? You know, our dad, our husband, he's in jail for his principles. Where, where is our shepherd? And they get no answer. What is your suspicion, Bill? Why do you think the Pope is so silent on this? He speaks out about everything, as you mentioned in your column. Climate <laughs> change, gay marriage, uh, 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 procreation, uh, every, everything under the sun, the stock market, uh, uh, population control. He says nothing about the religious persecution of this regime in China upon its own people. Why? Well, if I knew that, I'd be infallible, right? I'd have such great wisdom. <laughs> Look, I'd say there's two, there's two possible explanations that I can see for the Pope's silence. We know he's silent. We see this. Um, he's not mm -hmm. speaking. So one, uh, one, I think, is that he calculates that if he says something that angers China, they break the deal. And they think this is the best deal they'll get. They, they acknowledge that it's not good. Like, it's not perfect. It's not what they want. But they're trying to preserve mm -hmm. the church. The other explanation is that he just doesn't care about these people. I think I'm, I'm sort of inclined to number one, which I think is the more charitable explanation. But it's, it's not a very good one uh, for not speaking up. Mm -hmm. You know, if that would be a realpolitik decision, in, right, that China is so bad, they're so hostile, we're never going to get the freedoms we deserve and so forth. Right. But this is the best deal we can make. And, and my answer to that, that can be your argument. That's a serious argument. And maybe in the long term, you'll be proved right. But I think if a church is going to make that argument, it has to acknowledge that this is the terrible cost it carries. We have to be mm -hmm. silent 
when members of her own flock are chucked in jail unjustly. Hmm. Yeah, or murdered unjustly, or rounded right. up unjustly, or tried exactly. unjustly. I mean, the horrors of China uh, that we have long detailed here and that you've written so eloquently about uh, for so many years, it, uh, I don't know how you turn a blind eye to that, unless, Bill, the other third possibility might be at a time when there is a cash crunch, China is there with an open checkbook and is willing to help on this initiative or that, and perhaps that buys them some goodwill. And the, the real politique that you talk about is a nice way to kind of talk over that uh, deeper transactional relationship. But we'll see what happens here. I want to move on to the relationship between America and China and what it could look like under a new administration, assuming Biden takes the presidency. Uh, Joe Biden said this about China to a crowd in Iowa last year. China is going to eat our lunch? Come on, man. They're not bad folks, folks. But guess what? They're not a they're, they're not, not, they're competition for us. They're not competition for us, Bill. Biden downplays it, this threat to China as an economic force or threat of China. Uh, is Biden in denial? Uh, yes, I think on that, on that he is. Uh, look, the Chinese people are not bad folks, but the Chinese government, the communist government, are very bad folks. And uh, mm -hmm. they are challenging the U.S. in a host of areas. They're challenging us in Hong Kong. You know, we have a lot invested in Hong Kong. It was sort of an American outpost in Asia. They're challenging us right. on spying. Look, we just had a congressman uh, who was sleeping with a spy. We just closed down a consulate in Houston that was a hotbed of spying. They're stealing our intellectual property rights. Um, all sorts of things. They're pressing us in every area. Secretary Pompeo this week sanctioned 14 more Chinese officials who are participating in the crackdown of Hong Kong. And let's be clear, the crackdown of Hong Kong is about making it less special by eroding any line between Hong Kong and China. Hmm. In a New York Times interview, Biden said he would not rush to remove the tariffs President right. Trump imposed on China. How do you foresee the Biden administration dealing with China when it comes to trade, particularly? Well, uh, I think that's a big question mark. I was encouraged that at least they're not going to take these things down because the Trump administration, mm -hmm. especially Secretary Pompeo, have done quite a few things like the sanctioning of these individuals. So I do think uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Biden is right to say, let's wait. I'm not in a rush to undo everything because I think that leaves him with a stronger hand. Here's my overriding worry, whether it's trade, whether it's spying, whether it's Hong Kong. My overriding worry is that what Joe Biden really wants from China is its signature on a climate deal. You know, you've got John yeah. Kerry pushing this. He pushes it like it's a, uh -huh. another religion. And uh, I'm afraid because any, any global climate deal needs China's name on it to have any credibility because they're one of the biggest carbon emitters. My, right. my fear is that they will look the other way on a lot of things because they so desperately want this deal. That would be ruinous. Uh, there's talk of former Mayor Pete Buttigieg, who has that great deep resume of having been mayor of South Bend, Indiana, that he may be Biden's pick for the next ambassador to China. How will that be read in Beijing, Bill, do you think? Uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, look, in some ways, I'm, I'm not so worried that he's not an expert. It's all the self-styled experts that get seduced by China. You know, they all think they've got the upper hand dealing with China, and China has a centuries-long history of making monkeys of people that do that. A, a lot really depends on what the policy is. Are they going to take China's challenge to us in the 21st century on a whole host of fronts, military, spy, mm -hmm. everything, cultural? Are they going to take that seriously, or are they going to give it all up to get you know, John Kerry, a climate deal that can win him a Nobel Prize. Yeah. Well, considering the aggressive acts in the in the uh, South China Sea, uh, the the aggression toward Taiwan, should right. Biden become president, what do you think is going to happen on that front, particularly Taiwan? And what might the response of a Biden administration be, Bill? Well, what I hope is that it's not ambivalence, because that's a very bad signal. Um, to China. Um, you know, throughout history, America has stood pretty firm on Taiwan because we recognize 
if we give a bad signal there, things could end up ugly. It doesn't necessarily mean right. China doesn't have to invade. A few years ago, or when I was living in Asia, more than a few years ago, maybe 20, 20 30 years ago, um, yeah. China did military exercises offshore of Taiwan and just drove the stock market down and created all sorts yeah. of havoc. So they have a lot of ways to do this. And look, that's one of the things that they're going to do. You mentioned trade. Australia right. called for an independent investigation at WHO for how COVID-19 came about. And since then, China's been trying to bully Australia on trade because Australia sends, it, it's a tremendous amount, maybe 40% of his exports go to China, raw materials. So that's what they're trying to do. They're signaling to everyone, if you don't, you know, hew to our line, we're going to pressure you using everything we've got. Yeah, well, the entanglements we've seen unveiled this week with this spy ring connected to uh, Democratic politicians in California and elsewhere, possibly Hunter Biden's exposure to the Chinese on that investigation. How do you think all of this ends? What does it tell us, Bill? Does it reveal how deep the tentacles of China run in the establishment of the United States? I think that's what it's starting to reveal. You know, a lot of the work they do is on campus. They fund these Confucius yep. institutes. They work through, um, you know, student associations of Chinese and so forth. So it's not one thing. It's it's they probe with um, with everything they got. Look, this week too, um, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo suspended these cultural exchange programs where they right. take and pay for our congressional staffers to go travel in China. You know, one of the benefits they have is then they develop ties with these people. And you can't tell me that they're not trying to use those um, those ties for espionage when they can. Yeah, those junkets. Bill McGurn, thank you. As always, Bill's commentary can be found at The Wall Street Journal at WSJ.com. Thank you, Bill. Merry Christmas. Thanks, Raymond. You too. The Spider Who Saved Christmas, my new picture book, has spent four weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. Thanks to all of you who supported it. The book revives an all but forgotten legend surrounding the Christmas story, and it explains the origins of Christmas tinsel. Visit discoverlegends.com for more information. Copies are available at the EWTN catalog there at EWTNRC.com on Amazon. Or if you'd like signed editions, go to my website, RaymondArroyo.com, for ordering information. This is the last week for those signed editions, by the way. Uh, the Will Wilder series also makes a great stocking stuffer for those middle-grade readers on your list. And The World Over is a podcast. We're downloadable at iTunes. Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. That's all the time we have for now, but be sure to be here next week. Cardinal George Pell and Jose Feliciano will join us in exclusives. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thank you for joining us. I'm Raymond Arroyo. Bye now.